Fallout Equestria Child of the Stars Chapter 8, Part 3 My trembling hooves made the task far harder, yet as I fished for more information from whatever might have been stored on this terminal, a fleeting feeling of pride enveloped me, even if I'd technically cheated in order to retrieve whatever might have been stored on this terminal. As the machine unlocked, I was met with several files and swiftly downloaded them onto my pitbuck. One more thing caught my eye, however, and that was a flickering small red box in the bottom right corner of the screen. I didn't recognize it since I wasn't a pony who usually studied terminals in any detail, and these weren't the standard stable tech models either. Moving down the list of files led me to the blinking light. Warning. Sublevel 1 and 2 compromised. Security systems activated by order of Overseer. Amir's tinny voice sounded and then repeated the warning about the compromisation of the two sublevels. It certainly wasn't the sophisticated, charismatic tone of the Overseer. For a moment, I was just glad of that, though that swiftly faded as I realized exactly what I was being told. Then, as if on cue, the whole room shook, dust trailing from the roof tiles as the lights flickered. I staggered back from the desk, and the boom which had preceded the shutter was swiftly followed by the dull clatter of gunfire. Fuck! Could this get any worse? Was my first thought, followed swiftly by a list of what might be going on. Maybe it was Star? Uh, maybe the security system had finally decided to do its job and was killing some rad roaches or something? If it was the latter reason, it only deepens the puzzling riddle regarding the Overseer's actions. Yet, I highly doubted that she'd lose control over her own facility, so if it wasn't her, then the question remained as to what was happening down here. Another boom, this time much louder, shook the office violently. Fuck. Why couldn't my jobs ever be easy? Well, says the pony who left her friends and got herself abducted by a damn robot. Now, you could be turning into Celestia knows what Dragonfire. My conscience retorted in an amused-sounding tone of voice. I just grunted in irritation as I levitated my barding from the desk and clumsily attempted to put it on. The sounds of rapidly repeating gunfire reported again in the wake of the second boom, now sounding way too close for my comfort. Jerry appeared in the right doorway, glancing cautiously at the ceiling. I didn't see any pony. There weren't even any guns up there. She informed me while appearing to be upset, or was it that she was angry with herself? With an uncomfortable twist of my tender midsection, I managed to slip my barding over my flank and up over to my back. Besides the thick coat of sweat and patches of vomit that still clung to my coat, my barding still felt the same. Well, at least that little fucker hadn't messed with my gear. At that snide mental comment, I redirected my focus onto the situation at hoof. Since I was not particularly desirous of having an untimely end because I was being distracted by my conscience or whatever. Just... Don't think about whatever she may have done to you. Dragon, just don't think about it now. You have Cherry to save you, and now you have potential hostiles above you that you will likely need to deal with. I reminded myself firmly. And with that, I took a step out of the cover afforded by the terminal's desk. Cherry, stay close. I instructed the mare almost subconsciously. The pink mare was quick to obey, resuming her usual place close to my tail as I stepped towards the door, yet... Another roiling movement once again disturbed my body uncomfortably. Glancing back, however, I recalled something. Cherry looked at me strangely as I paused, my eyes directed towards the pony-shaped ash pile before the desk, and more specifically, its former hooves. Could it... I wondered briefly. My horn flared, digging through the ash until it struck something solid. The battered old star-shaped music box looked no better than it had centuries ago, as I suspended it in my magical aura. Its once golden coat was now completely replaced by a dull brown texture, yet I still could see the heart engraved into its center, and with a push of my magic, it popped open. Um, what is it? Cherry asked. I glanced at her, and she looked at the pre-war technology over. Most likely she was, in her mind, wondering how much it was worth. Something from a long time ago, I simply told her, with no real idea as to why I had answered her in the way that I had. I didn't play it. I doubted that it even still worked, as the many gears looked no better than the rusted exterior. I merely looked at it for a long moment, then the room shook again, and I promptly popped it closed. Come on, we're getting out of here, I instructed. With that, I slipped the metal trinket into my saddlebags. 
A part of me even wondered if I should wear it about my neck as it should be, but the rest of my mind regarded that idea as if it were a complete stranger attending some party uninvited. A few corridors later, I found myself peering around the corner of a black door frame, the double doors of a stairwell at the end of the corridor just beyond. Cautiously, I approached the doors, creeping as steadily as I could to stop the throbbing discomfort in my stomach. A loud bang sounded from the ceiling above me, and the loud sound echoed throughout the room. And as if I already wasn't nervous enough, I could hear a dull whoosh as I reached the doors of the stairwell. I froze, preferring that whatever was on the other side make the move first, instead of opening the doors and getting whatever nasty surprise this place might have. My ears perked up and swiveled in the direction of the closed doors as I attempted to heighten my focus through controlled breathing exercises. I didn't know what awaited me on the other side of the doors, and from the sound of bangs and explosions, I was highly skeptical that I would not like whatever it was. Did they have some sort of rocket launcher? I've heard enough of them in my time to know the distinctive sound of a missile, but more worryingly was that I hadn't seen any security features to indicate such high explosive technology. Star didn't have a missile launcher either. And I scowled, getting into a crouched position preparing to dodge whatever I was going to face on the other side of the door. Though I wasn't exactly looking forward to fighting someone with incendiary ballistic weaponry. Cherry flinched beside me, her ears perked and swiveling around. I closed my eyes, taking a breath as another bang seemed to splinter the wooden doors on the floor just above us, forcing them to open with a terrific crash. Mocking Mamorty! A buck's voice hissed around what I could only assume was a firearm. Yeah, those bucking turrets sure cut down the cannon fodder. Another voice, which sounded like a mare croaked, her vocal inflections sounding as if she had almost admired the turret's efforts. Well, those fuckers were nothing but unworthy meatbags anyways. The buck responded, seeming to spit out whatever he was holding in his muzzle. Now, come on! We're checking this last level and getting the fuck back to the surface. This place doesn't feel right. He added in a solemn tone of voice. My ears twitched nervously as I noted that there were at least two of them. I braced myself against the wall near the double doors as I levitated the saddle blaster right up in their direction of the closed door. As the sound of hoofsteps sounded upon the metallic frame of the stairs, I knew I'd at least have the element of surprise if they were hostile. They certainly didn't sound friendly, a fact that was almost a welcome relief from the lure you in and then fuck with your insides tactic, which the overseer employed. Another witty comment from my mind reminded me that it was my own fault for following her and not blasting her to scrap though. That thought was swiftly shutted away since I couldn't afford to be distracted. Not if I was to teach Cherry how to be a proper bounty hunter and how to handle uncertain situations like the one we were in now. Keep quiet, you maggots. Keep your eye out for any more of those fucking things. Another voice sounded. That of a mare again, at least I thought it was a mare's. It was as rough as sandpaper, almost making her sound like a stallion. The sound of the approaching pony's hooves rounded back towards me as the stairs turned, and I nodded to Cherry as she leaned against the opposite wall with Zap Zap levitating in her magic. Even with a barrel of my blaster pressed right up to their faces, I doubted it would kill them all. I needed her firepower if this went sour, which it most certainly would. We better find some serious shit down here, otherwise I'm gonna be seriously pissed. The buck, who I'd imagine had a rather large build by the sound of his heavy hooves, growled. Yeah, Slab's right. We wasted Sigil knows how many savages to get down here. Chief, you gonna tell us what the fuck we're looking for? The mayor hissed. I gritted my teeth at the banter being spoken, the ears upon my head twitching. The thought of asking Cherry to kill another pony was swiftly becoming more prominent, yet it was just another lesson of the wasteland. There was no innocence once you reached self-awareness. Only the level of every pony's guilt. Shut the fuck up! The lot of you! If Carnage sent us down here with an army of savages, then you can be sure that he expects us to get what he asked for! The gruff mare, who I identified as having a rather odd name of Chief, added bluntly. My visor was now trying to pick them out through the faded windows of the door, and the red light's intermittent flickers, which occasionally outlined their silhouettes, wasn't promising. I glanced back at my companion, her fearful eyes still locked onto the double doors, yet to her, they were still just voices. She had no idea what could transpire in the impending few minutes. Killing geckos was one thing, but what she could be about to do was nothing short of murder. That guy doesn't care what he's getting at as long as there's some blood flowing, and the Baron ain't pissed at him. The buck who I also identified as Slab added almost resentfully. 
the red outline of the second mare seemed to squirm with either laughter or nervousness at Slab's opinion. You're doubting the master's ability, Chief growled angrily, leaning in on the buck despite being half his size. Now it was his turn to squirm as the little mare's eyes bore into his like hot daggers. No, I, I, I ain't saying nothing like that, I, I just... He stammered nervously. Well, it's lucky for you that you shut your muzzle right then, because if you run it anymore with such treasonous talk, I'll be telling the boss all of your complaints against him. Then it will be your blood that's flowing, Chief hissed coldly. That seemed to shut the buck right up, and he swiftly turned back to facing the lower door. Now, you two, get the fuck down there and check for any fucking relics, Chief demanded angrily, pushing the pair downwards with their forehooves. They grumbled to one another before trotting swiftly towards us. Shit. Ah, shit. Okay, it was now or never, I thought as I looked back. Jerry, I need you to- Hey, who the fuck are you? Shit. <laughs>